justice system there. Here we go. Why do we eat? Energy. And protein. Nutrients. Oh, yeah. All those things are kind of right. Yeah. Oh, yes. Get the nutrients. What do we need nutrients for? To make energy. To make energy. 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 energy and proteins and all this stuff that we need. Okay, so that's why we eat. We don't eat because something tastes good. We eat to get the nutrients. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is one giant tube that runs through the body. One big, long, giant tube that runs through the body. I don't want to use brown, that would be too obvious, wouldn't it? So, the thing's going this way. Leftovers come out the other end. I prefer to call it leftovers. I know everyone else calls it waste, but I prefer to call it leftovers simply because when I talk about waste, I like to only uh, refer to metabolic waste, the stuff that we create, the waste we create rather than this is just stuff that we couldn't break down or couldn't absorb. If we break it down, then we try and absorb it. If it's small enough to absorb, we absorb it. If we can't break it down, then we can't absorb it. If we break it down, but not to the point where we can absorb it, and we can't absorb it, then it just keeps going through. So whatever we can't break down, whatever we can't absorb, comes out the other end as leftovers. We eat to get the nutrients, the stuff we can't break down, the stuff we can't absorb, keeps going until it comes out the other end as waste. The leftovers. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Everybody understands that? Mm -hmm. So when that kid swallows the dime, how's it come out the other end? A dime. Not a nickel and five pennies. It comes mm -hmm. out of the dime. We can't break it down. We can't absorb it. It keeps going through. The gastrointestinal system begins at the mouth, including the tongue, the teeth, and pharynx. We can even include the lips, really, helping to hold some of that stuff in as we take in liquids. Continues from the body as long to the exit at the anus. The upper GI runs from the mouth to the stomach. The lower GI includes the small intestines, large intestines, and the anus. The oral cavity is lined, of course, with mucosa. It includes the hard palate and the soft palate. The hard palate is the bony maxilla. The soft palate continues as the uvula. Remember the uvula is a little punching bag? That is uh, what's going to initiate the gag reflex. You remember this? The uvula is the punching bag that hangs down in the middle of your throat, the middle of your mouth, right into your oropharynx. It initiates the gag reflex. Avoid choking. Now notice this next part, the salivary glands, and I'm not going to test you on the salivary glands, so I just want you to hear this real fast. They're made up of the parotid gland, which is right here, you can see here, the cheek, the parotid, and then the sublingual, and submandibular. This is what makes saliva. They are salivary glands. They make saliva, not salivary glands. Salivary glands make saliva. Now, what is saliva used for? Taking. <clears throat> okay. uh, so, moisture. Moisture. Moisten. 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 Yes. I would say it's like a... Aid in the swallowing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mixing with the foods. It also contains an enzyme called amylase that breaks down carbohydrates. Except that doesn't that process doesn't start until it actually hits the stomach. But it starts mixing with it. It has an antibacterial property to it. Helps to give the bacterial numbers in my 
Saliva is released from the salivary glands upon the sight, smell, and taste of food. Which is why when you're standing in line at that rest at that fast food restaurant and you're looking up at the menu and all those pretty pictures, and you start having that stuff dripping out of your mouth, and, oh I can't wait to get those donuts. Yeah. Truly. Alright. Uh, mastication is the chewing, tearing, and grinding of food. This is the mechanical breakdown of food. So we take a bite of that pizza and then we chew it up to make it into smaller and smaller and smaller pieces. Then the next thing we have to do is swallow it, but we have to get it back to the esophagus to where we can swallow it. And that is called deglutition. And the thing that helps with deglutition is that big, ugly tongue. Yours is okay. The pharynx branches into the esophagus and the larynx. The epiglottis is what keeps food from going down into the air tube. Make sure that it goes down into the food tube, the esophagus. The esophagus is a flexible muscular tube that delivers food to the stomach. The smooth muscle moves the food along in a process called peristalsis, which is the same process we've seen in other tubes that move things along. So rather than just squeezing the food down, it pushes it down this way for the peristaltic action. Pushes the food down. Only the first third of your esophagus is under voluntary control. In other words, you think about swallowing something. <laughs> that was my animated swallowing sound. And you swallow the first third of the esophagus. And then after that, it takes over involuntarily. And that involuntary peristaltic action continues all the way through until you get to the end. You're at the anus, you once again have voluntary control, hopefully. How come sometimes, like when you're trying to swallow a pill or something, it like won't go down? Like I, I'm able to swallow pills, and I've met people who like really can't even swallow yes. at all. But sometimes I'll go to swallow a pill. And I'll put like the liquid in my mouth, but the pill itself will not swallow. Like it won't. <laughs> like, do you know what I mean? I don't know how to explain it other than that. It kind of just it kind of just stays. Well, one of the things saliva does is it helps to mix with food to make it easy to swallow. So when you chew up that pizza, what you end up with after you chew it up, if you take that pizza and you bleh, put it on your hand, you'd have a gooey, slimy mess. Well, gooey slimy makes it down that esophagus a lot easier than one solid pill does. Mm -hmm. So that one solid pill doesn't have that nice smooth like sliminess. Gotcha. Which is why a lot of times they sell pills that are coated in something mm -hmm. that makes it easier to swallow. Because it, it it has a coating on it that mixes it with saliva that makes it really slimy very quickly. It yeah. reduces that friction. So without that, um, without the friction, it goes down easy. But the pills without that coating tend to have more, create more friction, makes it a little more difficult. Mm -hmm. But there's also that mental aspect. No. Of, all right, so now we're down to the stomach, that one organ. This is not the stomach. Stomach is one organ here. Large sac where the chemical uh, breakdown of food begins. The stomach can expand like, a, like an accordion because of all these rugae, all these areas of mucosa that have these folds in. So it allows the stomach to expand more and hold more stuff, like donuts. Mm -hmm. uh, the stomach is divided into several areas. The cardia, here. The fundus is the rounded dome-shaped part of the stomach. Uh, that's a good term to know because we're going to see other organs that have rounded dome shaped tops that we call the fundus. The body of the stomach, the pylorus is here, and then this right here is the antrum. So sometimes the antrum is considered part of the pylorus. I, I have it separate as its own separate part, but it's actually part of the pylorus here. What else? Uh, I'm not going to worry about parietal cells and making intrinsic factor. But here, there's a doorway. Here, there's a doorway. So we have a doorway 
here between the esophagus and the stomach, and we have a doorway here between the stomach and the first part of the small intestines, the glottis. The first doorway up here is called the lower esophageal sphincter, also known as the cardiac sphincter, but nobody calls it that. Everyone calls it the lower esophageal sphincter of the LES. You're going to want to know about the LES. Because that lower esophageal sphincter helps to keep things from moving from the stomach upward into the esophagus. That doorway, it's a muscular doorway, and it closes like this, it opens like this. Look up here, not down there. It closes like this, it opens like this, it closes like this, it opens like this. It's a muscular doorway. So that doorway is going to help to keep stuff from coming up and back into the esophagus, like stomach acid. Why don't we want stomach acid coming into the esophagus? Uh, it, can cause, it can destroy the cell here. Mm -hmm. It can cause cancer. Eventually cause cancer. Yeah. What type of cancer would that be? Esophagus? It's called Barrett's esophagus. Mm -hmm. It's a type of... That would be a pseudostratified epithelial cancer. I'm sorry? What's the question? Oh boy. <laughs> I don't give birth. Okay. And we give birth. Um, we have one doorway, the lower esophageal sphincter, to make sure that nothing comes up this way. We have another doorway here called the pyloric sphincter, and that is going to make sure that the stuff doesn't leave the stomach too early. It's called chyme, C H Y M E. That is a mixture of the food with the saliva, with the acids, with the enzymes, all mixing together is called chyme. That's going to stay in the stomach for as little as a half hour up to about two hours. All right. Yeah, you want. When everything's in the stomach and mixed around, now it's in a mostly liquid state. That chyme is mostly liquid. So even if you eat pizza that's solid, that chyme now is mostly liquid. And that's going to move into the first part of the small intestines. The first part of the small intestines is that little loop of intestine that's about 10 inches long. It's called the duodenum or duodenum. Either pronunciation is fine. Duodenum or duodenum. All of the acids and the enzymes are in there. Wait, so that brings me to the question of um, once the food hits your stomach and broken down by the acid, is the whole um, collection of acid moving down now? Or is it filtering it? Well, it's, like it's also becoming less acid now because it's mixing with other things. So the stomach only. So the stomach acid is neutralizing gotcha. as a result of and then the other stuff that's in there. And so, it's back up yeah. acid. so it's becoming less and less acidic. Gotcha. But it is still acidic. Gotcha. Just not it's as acidic. Not as like a straight acid. Really small right. Not as, just not a straight acid. But it is more acidic. Still acidic. Mm -hmm. So it's going to move into the duodenum. The duodenum knows this, so it's prepared. It has enough mucosal lining that it's like. No problem. We're good with this. Okay. I have a question. Yes. Where did um bio come from? Can you wait? Mm -hmm. Because actually, I'll show you kind of right now. Um, so if a person has um, no gallbladder, if we've taken that out, but they still have a bile duct intact, that's blurring drip by drip by drip bile in here. Um, if they eat a fatty meal, normally the, bi the gallbladder would squeeze out a big bunch of bile in the air because they have a fatty meal. But if there's no gallbladder, then those fats um, don't get mixed with enough bile. If they don't get mixed with enough bile, then they don't get broken down. And what happens to things that don't get broken down? They're all right now. I'm sorry? They get taken out. They keep going through. 
which so could cause the patient to end up with fatty stool. That's what it looks like. That's not how it should be. It could be fatty, yeah. Which is why if somebody has their gallbladder taken out, the doctor's telling them you need to you know, reduce your fat intake. Stick with low fat meals. So, if the gallbladder is taken out, you just go ahead and try and dial it I could. Oh, well, you could. Yes. So, what if the gallbladder is taken out, then it's just your bowel just moves at the bottom? Then, they're, then they're not going to be making, they're not going to be oh. mixing with bile, so they're not going to have that same ability to break down the fats. Mm -hmm. So, most fats will just keep going through. Yeah, but I don't understand <coughs> what you mean by fatty stool. Like, how can you tell that the stool that is Fatty stool floats. Uh, yeah, and it'll be, it could be greasy as well, because fat is greasy. What? So it could come out greasy. That's why you know, there's that one diet supplement that people can take that um, it does exactly what the label says it would do. Ally. Ally, yeah. And they'll say that it will uh, it'll be so that you could eat a regular fatty meal but not ingest any of the fats from it. So it was not my lead. I used to have your bowl there taken out with the common duck bottle. I mean, like, bottle bottle duck. Duck, they should, it would uh, the ally supplement be a good thing for them? No. Because it was reversed. Because the ally is not going to allow fats to be absorbed. Oh. So the same thing is going to happen. If How something's not absorbed, it's going to, yeah, something's not absorbed. I had actually took it before, and it made me look at that consistently. Yeah, it's bad. What? If you notice, one of the main side effects or potential side effects is anal leakage. Mm -hmm. Oh, gosh. What? No thanks. Ally. 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 Because it binds to fats. So if it grabs all the fats, it says, okay, we're not going to let you break down. Well, then all the fats go through at once without getting broken down. And fat's very greasy, so it just leaks right out. Oh, so that's like a, a supplement. Is, someone's, is, is that someone trying to lose weight? Yeah. Because they want to eat the fatty meals, but they don't want the fat. Gotcha. They don't want the fat calories from it. I so, like I mean, you, certainly you've heard of things like fat-free yogurt. Mm -hmm. You've heard of fat-free cookies or something like that. Well, they taste like crap. Mm -hmm. Who wants to eat that crap? We want to eat the stuff that tastes good. So we eat the stuff that tastes good, like cheeseburgers. A cheeseburger is going to taste really good with a lot of fat in it. But then it adds a lot of fat calories, and that's bad for us. But if we don't want to absorb the fat, all we have to do is take that supplement, and then those fat molecules don't get broken down. Instead, they all get collected together. So all collected together, those fat molecules just move all out right at once. Which means all that fat could just leak right out of the anus. Oh, it's walking down the street. Hmm, walking down the street. What's That's the medicine that um, makes you poop out the fat? That's it. What is it called? How long? It will, uh, it'll create problems that people don't want. It's for weight loss, right? That's the idea. Again, the idea is that if you eat fatty meals, you're going to gain a lot more weight than if you eat fat-free meals. But fatty meals taste better than fat-free meals. So how do you get the delicious taste, but not all the ugly fat? You take one of those pills, but then you have anal leakage. Okay. So people aren't looking at you because you're fat. People are looking at you because you have poop dripping out of your leg, out down your leg. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's six one half does the other. So the first part of the small intestines is the duodenum. So there's not much absorption taking place here. There's not much absorption takes place in the stomach. Very very little. However, the next two parts, the jejunum and the ileum. These are the next part of the small intestines. This is where most of the absorption takes place. The jejunum is about eight feet long. The ileum, spelled I-L-E-U-M, is about 12 feet long. And this is where most of the absorption takes place. Both of these, not just the ileum. 
both the jejunum and the ilium is where most of the absorption takes place. If you look here, uh, this is just showing a section of the intestine. Notice there's two muscle, two layers of muscle. And there's a longitudinal layer and there's a circular layer. And both of those layers together help propel forward. And you look inside the tube and you notice that it has all these little projections. And these are called villi. And you think, well, they look like cilia. They would sweep. But no, these don't sweep. They don't move. They're just there to increase surface absorption. So as the stuff is coming through the tube, right, it's traveling down this way in a liquid form. It's being broken down to smaller and smaller pieces. As it's traveling through, those little tiny things are being absorbed through these cells and into the blood, which then goes to the liver. Which then decides, all right, what we do with all this? Do we store this glucose? Do we put it in quick storage, long term, or just put it right into the blood? All that is happening in here. So you said the villa does it? The villi, villi increased surface area. Rather than just being flat by having these projections, look on the board for a minute. See the arrow? Mm -hmm. Think of the arrow as being like a small molecule of glucose. Now that molecule, molecule of glucose can get absorbed right here and into the blood, right at that point. Or here, 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 as compared to if it was just flat. If it was just flat in there, then it, it would be absorbed off. here, or here, or here, or here, or here. By having these projections, it increases the amount of area where particles can get absorbed into the blood. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Now, is that a good or a bad thing, or it depends? I'm sorry. Is that a good or a bad thing? That's a good thing. We want to have the ability to absorb as much as possible. Otherwise, we'd end up wasting a lot of stuff that we brought into our body that we broke down, like the stuff that we want. So, the villi versus. A flat surface. The particles can get absorbed into the blood here, or here, or here, or here, or here, or here, or here. Whereas on a flat surface, they just go straight across that way. Not nearly as much area for those particles to move, to get moved across. So this really helps take advantage of all that space and says, let's get as much into our blood as possible. Longitudinal muscle, circular muscle. Circular muscle would squeeze like this. Longitudinal muscle would squeeze like this. Put both of those muscles together and you get this. Which creates a unidirectional flow, one way flow. That's what we call Peristalsis. It makes that sound. If you listen. Okay. All right. Right about here, the ilium, I L E U M, ends. There's an ileocecal junction. This right here, it's, it sends a seven column. The seven column is actually here. This part here is called the sequel. And right here, the ilium comes in and dumps all the leftovers. Which means now, basically, we're done absorbing stuff. Once everything moves into this next part, we're pretty much done absorbing. Um, in the large intestines, 
And we can absorb water, some salts, but that's about it. There's not a whole lot of absorption in the large intestines at all. A lot of water absorption, but not a whole lot of nutrient absorption. And vitamin K, but not a whole lot of other stuff. So basically, all the absorption, most of the absorption, occurs in the small intestines. Then the small intestines connects right to here. This first part is called the cecum. And you can even see the vermiform appendix is hanging right off of there. So if you look at the appendix, this little worm-like structure hanging off of the cecum this way, If you were to go inside of here and look down, what you would see is that it's actually open, but it dead ends. So it goes down into here, and then there's a dead end. So it's like a tube that it's hollow, but dead ends. For what? What's its purpose? Yeah, for what? It does have a purpose. We talked a little bit about the tonsils, right? The palatine tonsils that are inside the mouth. The palatine tonsils, I said, act as filtering stations like lymph nodes. They act to help get rid of bacteria, viral particles, white blood cells that engulf that stuff. That's the same kind of thing the appendix does. So what? Part of the immune system, part of the lymphatic system. It helps to get rid of bacteria, broken down parts, um, back, uh, white blood cells that have engulfed bacteria, recycling them. Anywhere from just a, what is it, six to eight centimeters up to like 16 <coughs> centimeters. I think it's the longest I've heard of. Does it move? No, okay. it's, pretty, it's pretty much stationary. It's not a snake. Uh, but yeah. I heard of somebody that's been in Boston, so what does that attempt to do? Well, yeah. have you ever heard of somebody's tonsils being swollen? Okay. Think think of it this think of it this way. Think of the tonsils as being like a prison, right? What do prisons hold? Bad guys and bad guys. The idea is that um, the tonsils are there to collect pathogens and white blood cells that engulf pathogens and then break all that stuff down. Does that make sense? Okay. So if a prison has 50 guards and the prison is only designed to hold 500 inmates, but over time, because of prison overcrowding, it holds 1,000 or even 2,000 inmates, but you still only have 50 guards. What happens when it gets to the point where that prison has 4,000 inmates, only 50 guards? Oh, they're going to they're gonna start to go, wait a minute, there's a lot of us, only a few of that. We're going to take over. With the tonsils, we call that tonsillitis. <laughs> We'd see that inflammatory process because it's overgrown with bacteria. The same thing can happen here, where... We could have an itis, an overgrowth. It's starting to, they're starting to take over the prison. What follows inflammation? Edema. Swelling, edema. With our tonsils, we can see them get swollen and swollen and swollen, but there's a lot of room up in here, right, in our mouth. Here, this is all sort of vacuum packed. So if this starts to swell and swell and swell, it could actually tear. First, rupture. If that tears, that means all of the blood supply that brings blood to here. So it's not gonna have blood in there. Or is blood it can be blood in It's tissue, it's just like your finger. There's blood going up into your finger, right? Mm -hmm. And then venous blood returning. So it's the same idea. It's tissue made up of cells that has to have blood. Well, if this tissue here tears, that means the blood's going to tear. The blood supply is going to tear. The vessels are going to tear. Now we have a mix of all that bacteria with all that blood. 
into the peritoneum, into that abdominal, abdominal area. Is that where like septicemia? That can cause septicemia. So your first cause we call peritonitis. Then it can cause septicemia, which can lead to what? Um, death? Yeah, death. Death. So if that swells to the point where it tears, now we have a problem. Now we have a whole lot of bacterial stuff all mixing with blood and the peritoneum. Now we have a serious issue. That can lead to death. So one more time, what's the... But, hold on, hold on one second. But just like the tonsils, we can take the tonsils out. Yeah, I was saying, we should have been, never had it stupid. I mean, it's not stupid, but it's just like, it's a risk of it. The tonsils have a purpose, though. But if they get more infected than what they're worth, we can take them out. And the person will be fine. The appendix is the same way. It can become more infected than it's worth, and we take it out, and the patient will be fine. But some people like to think that the appendix doesn't have a, a, a job to do. It does. It's part of the lymphatic system, part of the immune system. It helps to recycle white blood cells. Remember, remember white blood cells go out and engulf these foreign bacteria? Mm -hmm. Well, what the hell does it do now that it has a bunch of bacteria in it? It's got to go get recycled. It's got to get something that's going to clean it up. It's got to go somewhere to have that done. Or even it's got to go somewhere to get destroyed so that it can destroy, we can destroy all that bacteria and everything along with it. That's what this tissue does, along with our tonsils, along with our power patches, along with our lymph nodes. What is your question? Wait, hold on a second. What is your question? Oh, you answered me. Okay, what is your question? So the blood goes out, goes in and comes back out. It's tissue. Blood goes in every tissue and comes back out. Look at your finger. Blood goes up here, delivers nutrients, and then leaves again. Mm -hmm. Look at the skin on your eyelid. Blood goes to there, delivers nutrients, and then leaves again. Mm -hmm. So it's just a piece of tissue where blood goes, delivers nutrients, and then leaves again. Picks up carbon dioxide, waste products, and leaves again. It's tissue made up of cells. So it has to have blood supply. So once it's removed, what is like, what happens? Nothing. It's not stupid. I'd say it's stupid. <laughs> it does have a purpose. I mean, it does, but it's, it's a necessary purpose. No, it is a necessary purpose. Just like our tonsils have a necessary purpose. That's why we don't take tonsils out of everybody. Because they do have a purpose. But if they're creating more of a problem than they're worth, then yeah, then we take them out. I don't know how else I can explain this. Oh, so I mean, I, we, I get it, but it's just anything. Like, I get it, but it's just like, if you had like breast cancer, like you would take the breast off if it would become too much of a problem. Then right. The breast cancer, the breast. If, if the gallbladder is creating too much of a problem, take the gallbladder out. The spleen, if the spleen's rupture is creating a problem, take the spleen out. If the heart's creating a problem, take everything out. Well, right. we're stuck with that. So, if the brain's creating a problem, which I'm starting to think that it is, <laughs> well, you gotta keep the brain. You can't do anything with like that. If the tongue's creating a problem, you got the tongue? Yeah. Usually it's from things like talking in class. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I have that ability, you know. It's in the student handbook. Look it up. So. The students talk too much during class. I am permitted to surgically remove their tongue. <laughs> it's on page nine. Look it up. <laughs> it's not true. It's not true. I, well, I've written it in on page nine. <laughs> so that's what the appendix does. It does have a purpose. Don't listen to those people who say it doesn't do anything. It does do something. But just like other things, it can become more of a problem than it's worth, and if we remove it, the patient will still be fine. So when it ruptures, is it like what happens? Is it like, uh, all that stuff. Because remember, stuff from here right. can leak down into here. So that's all poo right. with all that bacteria. Because the poo is not the dangerous part for the most part. The bacteria is the dangerous part that's with all that poo that, um, that is now going to leak into that peritoneum and into the blood. Peritonitis, man, that's no joke. 
They would need to go in surgically and do a lot of flushing. If it's in the blood, then we're going to just give them lots of IV antibiotics. But if it's in the peritoneum, you got to open them up and flush all that area and suction it all out and try to get as much bacteria out and then still give them IV antibiotics. So, what causes somebody to have a colonoscopy? Colonoscopy. This is way off topic. Why are you going way off topic? Oh, I'm, I'm still trying to talk about the colon. You're not in the colon. You're still have the, the, the cecum. Right. And you're actually, we haven't talked about what it is, and you're wanting to remove part of it. I'm sorry. We'll get there, right? Yeah, maybe not. Um, if a person has a problem with their intestine, with their large intestines, because this is all waste, this is all leftovers, very, very little absorption, water, salts, maybe some vitamins, like vitamin K. That's it. Nothing else gets absorbed in here for the most part. So this is just waste. So now the waste is going to travel up, over, down, around, and then stored. If there's a problem somewhere in here where we have to take out this part of this, then the waste just goes here, over, and then out to a bag. That's all. So something like cancer. Cut out the colon, and that way the cancer is gone. You don't have to worry about it spreading to other parts of the body and killing them. If a person has had an injury, like shot, and the tissue was destroyed, enough of that was destroyed. If it was infected, you can smell infected colon. And this this will stink up the entire pathology floor. It's pretty bad. Mm -hmm. It'll make you gay. All right. So the first part here is the cecum. <laughs> so coming from the uh, ileum ile um, the waste then goes into the ascending colon. That's the part that goes up. Then there's a bend there. That is called the hepatic flexure. A flexure is a bend. Hepatic is it's over here in the liver. And then it goes across this way, transverse colon. Transverse because it goes across. Then there's another bend over by the spleen, why they call that the splenic flexure. Then it goes down. That's the descending colon. So it goes ascending colon, transverse colon, descending colon. Then it goes into the only S-shaped part of the colon. That is the sigmoid colon. Because sigma is the Greek letter S. So when they're going to name that part of the colon, and they thought, what should we call the S-shaped part of the colon? They literally called it the S-shaped part of the colon. Sigma means... S. It's a Greek letter S. Then that goes into the straight part. The straight part is called the rectum. They call that the rectum because rectus means straight. So what should we call the part that goes up? We'll call it the ascending colon. What do we call the part that goes across, transversely? Transverse colon. What do we call the whole part that goes down? The going down colon, descending colon. What do we call the S part? We call it the S part, the sigmoid colon. What do we call the straight part? We call it the straight part, the rectum, because rectus means straight. Very simple nomenclature, very simple way to name this. It's the storage unit. And then we have control once again. The anus. There's actually an anal canal. There's actually two separate uh, sphincters here, but don't worry about, about that. Uh, you'll notice that it sort of has these pouches in it, these puckerings called haustra. And again, that's to expand to hold more waste, we'll say. 
And peristalsis is still moving stuff through here. Peristalsis. Okay. Okay. And you probably should know about this one. If you look in the notes, you'll notice that it's bold, checked and underlined. Big, ugly, yellow, fatty pad. That's what I should think of. Hanging off the stomach right here. That is it's continuous with the peritoneum, which is the double layer membrane of the abdomen. This helps to protect as well as keep things in place. That's donut fat. Not that momentum, this guy. <coughs> So if a person gets fatter and they've got a fat belly, is their momentum fatter as well? No. Yes. Really? Yes, because it's fat, it's storage. Oh, okay. So it's going to store more fat also. Is that to protect this the abdominal cavity from the rest of, like, the, the weight? It helps to protect the underlying organs. Because we don't have any bones or anything there. Yeah. <coughs> so it helps cushion things that way. That's pretty. Looks kind of deflated. Big yellow fatty pad. Good example from the side of you. Mesentery helps to connect all the small intestines. Well, all the intestines actually helps to keep it together. That's <coughs> not What are the questions you have? All iron located, sort of up underneath uh, the liver. Yes, it is. Oh, I was going to say, why is the liver that have that green? That's it. Wow. Oh, shit. What is it? <coughs> Notice the pancreatic duct coming through here as well, all emptying enzymes right into that lodging. The liver is considered part of the. The liver is considered part of the gastrointestinal system, even though food doesn't go through it. So it's considered an accessory organ. Because it does make it like, bile. Um, the gallbladder is going to take some of that bile. It's going to store it. And it's going to concentrate it, make it nice and thick. Files that thick yellow bitter taste and stuff that you throw up after you throw up everything else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the gallbladder helps make it nice and thick. So when you eat a really fatty meal, 
a signal gets sent to the gallbladder, it says squeeze out a big bunch of bile because we got some fatty stuff coming through. And that's going to come down through and, and now it's going to help break down those fats. The pancreas, also considered an accessory organ of the digestive system because it is going to release a whole lot of digestive enzymes in here. Do you recall the pancreas is located posterior to the stomach? Tucked inside the first part of the small intestines and brought them. There's a head here, a body, and then a tail, and then the spleen is right over here. That's a colon inside of a colon. I said. Well, it could be. This is looking inside of the large intestines. This is what, when we do a colonoscopy, this is the view that we get. Uh, is that on a man? I'm sorry? Is that on a man? Is this on a man? Yeah. I don't know. I'm looking at the inside of the colon. I can't tell if it's a male or female. It's not that good. You have to look at the outside of the body if no male or female. Okay. Um, I don't just try. <laughs> this is a polyp. Now polyps come in two basic forms. Either pedunculated, like this one is, looks like it has like a stock to it, like a trunk. Mm -hmm. Or sometimes those they're what we call sessile, which means it just sort of looks like a bump without like a tree stock. Oh. And do they hurt? Most of the time, people don't even know they're there. And most of the time, they don't cause any problems. And here's the thing about polyps. If you know somebody who's gotten a colonoscopy, they'll probably tell you that they found polyps on the colonoscopy. They're extremely common. When I rotated through gastroenterology, we did colonoscopies every morning up until about noon. What on, on patients. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of cameras. Up yeah. a lot of bones. You're about to say. And I've never, ever, ever seen a colon that didn't have at least one polyp. Mm. That's how common they are. Now most of the time we're doing a lot of patients who are 50 or so years old, but I've never ever ever seen a colon that didn't have at least one polyp. Now now that was in my short time doing gastroenterology, but still, I did a lot of colonoscopies. Most of the time, they were about this big. You see the little circle I'm making there? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Most of the time, they were about this big. And there was one or two or three of them. If we found one or two or three this size in that six feet of colon, that was usually not bad. Mm -hmm. Most every time that we'd find two or three of them that were this big in that much space, we'd still biopsy them, and they would come back negative. Yeah. They'd come back benign. But if they get to be this big, <coughs> that's a concern. That increases the likelihood of cancer greatly. Well, or if know. there's hundreds of them. So, we still have to biopsy this, send it out for that. <coughs> but this is a bad sign. So they can be cancerous? This big. I'm sorry? They can be cancerous? Yeah. And how are they formed? Just extensions of mucosa, the tissue right here. And they've gone bad. It's just like a regular abdomen. Yeah, well, yeah, you have to realize that this is all covered with mucosal lining. Look up here on the screen. This is the large intestine, six feet of it. It's all covered with a mucosal lining. Do you realize every day how much stuff is getting moved through your intestines? Mm -hmm. So as it's getting moved through, a lot of that mucous membrane gets moved along with it. Being which means that, yeah, which means it's constantly being replaced. It's supposed to be there, it's supposed to be lost, because that actually helps in moving everything along. But it constantly gets replaced, which means the body's constantly making new, making new, making new, making new, making new, just like its skin, which is why the person lives long enough until they get skin cancer, because their skin throughout their lifetime has been replacing, 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 so it's eventually gonna change. The bone marrow, because it's constantly making red blood cells, is constantly replacing the hematopoietic or condensed stem cells. So if a person lives long enough, they could get bone cell cancer, like a um, 
amount of water cancer. Or if they live long enough, they get colon cancer because of this constant replacement of mucosa. It's very, very common. Okay, so this is a page nine of the notes. Uh, this is from our, uh, so <laughs> Get your notes out. <laughs> Chemical digestion begins in the stomach. Even though I told you this slide contains that enzyme amylase. <laughs> These amylase have been activated after the stomach. Uh, there's hydrochloric acid in the stomach. This is good for killing things. That's what we want to do. We want them to die. We want to leave no survivors. Breaks down food, fibers, etc. Uh, pepsin is going to help to take those foods that you've eaten with protein in them. You know, like we had that Chick fil A sandwich with the pickle. And that comes with about, I don't know, maybe eight grams of protein in that Chick fil A sandwich with the pickle. So when you chew up that Chick-fil-A sandwich, what, the you, <laughs> what happens is it gets to your stomach, this enzyme takes the protein part and separates it out. Does all the protein come over here? Separates it out. Oh. That's Pepsin. That's Pepsin. That's which one? Pepsin. 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 <laughs> That's what takes the building blocks and creates individual blocks. Well, we're not right? there yet. Okay. Because we're not down to building blocks yet. We're at protein level still. So we're still at gotcha. I thought you meant like that's what breaks it down into the individual blocks. No, this takes it this takes out the, the Lego rocket, the Lego car, the Lego house. Oh, so this just takes out it's the It's just the taking protein those out and saying, stay right here. Everybody right here. Gotcha. Protein. Oh, it's still the protein. It's still a full protein. It's a molecule protein. Yes. Instead of a food protein. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's just separated out all by itself. Before it was all mixed in with the food. Uh, look here at the pH of the stomach is between 1.5 and 3.5. It's an arbitrary scale, right? The pH scale. Um, and the reality is the pH of the stomach. Depending upon the book you read, might say between one and three and two and four. So I did was split the difference. Blood has a pH around seven point four. Water has a pH of seven, right in the middle. <coughs> Give you an idea. Uh, as I said, the stomach has a thick protective layer that protects itself from the acid that it makes. All right, now here comes some fun stuff. When fatty foods enter the duodenum, cholecystokinin is secreted and causes the gallbladder to release bile. The bile breaks down large fats in a process called emulsification. Cholecystokinin, which is abbreviated CCK, also causes the pancreas to release these enzymes as well as enzymes from the villi. The pancreas can release enzy uh, the enzyme amylase, same enzyme we saw before for breaking down carbohydrates. Lipase. Breaks down those fats into small fatty acids, which makes sense, like pigs, like the Protease takes those proteins and breaks them down to smaller proteins. And peptidase now takes those smaller proteins and breaks them down into their individual amino acid Lego blocks. Yeah. Now we can absorb them. Yeah. So you have a multi step process here. We don't we once they're in the individual blocks, don't we build them back up to the specific purpose? Well, we have to absorb them first. Oh, okay. Because they have to be happens. small enough to be absorbed. Gotcha. Once they're small enough to be absorbed, <laughs> now we gotcha. build them back up in the proteins that we need. Gotcha. Notice all these enzymes in the A's? Yes. That's the rule. If you have an enzyme, <clears throat> you've got to end it in A's. If it's a sugar, it's gonna end it in O's. Like glucose, or fructose, or lactose. The villi also produce an enzyme called lactase. Lactase is the enzyme that breaks down the sugar molecule found in milk. That sugar molecule is called lactose. So if a person is, if a person is deficient 
in the enzyme <coughs> lactase, then we say that that patient is lactarded. No, we don't say that. No, we wouldn't say that. We say they are lactose intolerant, yes. Now, some patients can have some lactase made, which means they'll say they can have some dairy products, but not a lot. They can eat some cheese on their pizza, but they can't drink a milkshake. Some patients will say they used to be able to drink milk, but now they can't because their body's no longer making as much lactase as it once did. Sometimes we would hear people say when they were younger, they couldn't drink milk. But now they can. They got in their teen years, they could. Because their body started making lactase. No. However, you can take lactase. So there's nothing you can take to make you make more lactase, but you could literally take lactase. They sell it over the counter. And you take it right before you eat ice cream. So if you don't have that enzyme, you're like, here, here's a pill. It's in the pill. Now you have it. But you gotta take it right before you eat the stuff. Oh, every time. Yeah. Every time. So we have to eat something with dairy. Oh, or, I, oh, or, not you, the patient, or somebody who is like too intolerant. Mm -hmm. Eat something multiple times a day that has like dairy that they can't tolerate on a regular basis. They will take that pill four times a day. Yep. That's a lot. Yeah, but that's what they want, I guess. Then they then they're able to eat stuff they could eat before. Because what's going to happen if you can't break something down? <laughs> Come on, there's no block for blockage. It's going to keep going through. Oh, you say if you can't break it down, it just keep, it's going to be left over. It's going to keep going through. Well, that's a big sugar. That lactose sugar is a big sugar. Remember all that bacteria we have in our intestines? Mm -hmm. They'll use it. They'll be like, oh, you're not going to use this? Well, hey, we'll, we'll use it then. They break it down. They create gas. I want to say it hurts. <laughs> <laughs> They create gas. That's why you get And stuck. they create solid particles because they create gas. And then they create solid particles, which creates an osmotic pressure, which causes diarrhea. That's why there's the gas and the bloating and the cramping and the pain and the diarrhea. Yeah. Unless they took that pill first. I don't take that. And then they'd be fine. I'm fine. Like that. Like that. Something like that. Yeah. Enzyme like this. Uh, the portal vein is a little bit different from the other veins in our body because it doesn't actually, it's not really a true vein because it collects the blood from the areas, the portal system collects the blood from the intestines and from the stomach and brings it right to the liver where it branches off into smaller parts, which is unusual because usually veins branch off into bigger, but going into the liver, now it's collected all these things that we've just absorbed, so the liver decides what do we do with all these things. We put them in the blood. Do we put them in short-term storage, put them in long-term storage? What do we do next? The process of elimination is called bowel movement or defecation. The waste is referred to as feces or stool. I realize that you have a lot of other colorful terms for this, but we're going to stick with the medical terms. And meconium is the first stool of the newborn. That black tarry, oh, stuff. Yeah, what? Why? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just like that, that face, that same thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A can of duck. Um, a duck. A duck. A duck. Oh, a duck. <laughs> See, you make fun of me when I hear those things. A duck. A duck. Yeah. You're absolutely right. She ducks. Was so serious. Ducks. I was. ducks can have that. Let's get peace. I really um, in fact, several waterfowl, come to think of it, can have black tarry stool. Uh, and then if they do, they should see their position. Uh, just make sure he's not a quack. Yeah. <laughs> that one means that one. Yeah, you got that one. <laughs>
<laughs> that's so okay. Because he'll just build up. I know, that wasn't me either. Alright, that's it. <laughs> okay, that's good. Uh, let's look at some pathology. Yes, pathology. Anorexia. I feel like we might have talked about this before. Yeah, we did. Decreased appetite. Everybody in here has had anorexia at some point in time in their life. You've had a decreased appetite. Yep. You had a stomach flu or something where you're, watch, or you're pregnant. Uh, early in the pregnancy, you're watching TV and they're showing a commercial for Olive Garden and you're just going, oh God, if I look at this, I'm going to throw up right now. Yep. That's a decreased appetite. <laughs> anorexia and nervosa. That is the mental disorder where she looks like this but thinks she's fat and intentionally doesn't eat. That's different. That's different. Anorexia just means a decreased appetite. Nervous. Nervous. So what? So if we're looking at a chart, like in a um, hospital, and it has anorexia, you would just be saying that, would they even write that? Or would they use a different term? Like, anorexia. Oh. The person has a decreased appetite? Yeah. Anorexia. Yeah. So they would say anorexia under those symptoms? Yeah. If the person had an eating disorder, they would write anorexia and reversal. They wouldn't say like multiple fatigue or something. They could. But it still be anorexia. Like we know, yeah, like I know, because I've been yeah. to it. I'm saying so. I yeah, would well, no, you're going to see it out in the field. Yeah. You're going to see they're going to write anorexia. Oh. So you have to realize they're not talking about some person who's intentionally not eating, yeah. right? Dysphagia, difficult, painful eating or swallowing. Everybody's had this at some point in time. If you had a sore throat, if you had a toothache, sharp throat, something like that. Mm. Uh, let's skip down to esophageal varices, varicose veins in the esophagus, bulging veins. You see this in chronic alcoholics mostly. Um, and the bad thing about that is if they're chronic alcoholics and their liver is failing, uh, that causes a backup in the blood, which is what causes these veins to bulge, but it also causes a decrease in some of the clotting factors. And when these patients start to dry heave, they'll go. <laughs> And what'll come out is just blood. It'll mm. just come pouring out like someone turned on a faucet. Mm, that it's good. not coming from the stomach, it's coming from the esophagus. Looks like they're throwing up blood, but it's coming from the esophagus. Very dangerous in these okay. cases. Okay. Yeah, it seems terrible. In this case, yeah. This is one of the times where you say, yeah, that's dangerous because not only are we losing a lot of, even, if, even though it's out of a vein, they're losing a lot of blood and their clotting factors are depleted. So they're not going to clot very well. So for them, it's more dangerous. All right, are we ready for this next one? I think we are. Gastritis. Okay, uh, gastritis is described as acute or chronic. And infectious and non-infectious. Infectious and non-infectious. So an acute infectious gastritis is what people would call food poisoning. It is most commonly caused by our good friend Staphylococcus aureus. This is that uh, potato salad that was put out for the picnic at 11 o'clock in the morning, yeah. sat out in the sun all day long. Somebody brought it in, put it on the kitchen counter about 9 o'clock at night. It sat there for several more hours. People come home from the bar, it's 2.30 in the morning. They go, hey look, potato salad. So they start eating it. And then about an hour or two hours later, up to about eight hours later, they start to feel like they're going to be sick. 
and then they throw up and they feel okay for a little while and then about an hour after the first time they throw up again and then about an hour after that they throw up again and about an hour after that they throw up again you can almost set your watch you're going to throw up every hour on the hour for the next six maybe eight hours Maybe have some diarrhea thrown at the end just for kicks. But then they're done. They don't need an antibiotic because their body did exactly what it was supposed to do. Get rid of everything. They might need some fluids. In a hospital setting, we give them IV fluids. At home, Gatorade, Pedialyte. And the next day, they're going to feel like they're beat up with a baseball bat. But that's it. No, no other treatment is necessary. And you can see it in families where dad and the one kid come in to the hospital, sick, throwing up, mom and the other two kids are fine. What did you guys eat that they didn't? You can narrow things down pretty easily that way. This is the most common type of food poison. Staphylococcus aureus. Staphylococcus aureus. This is the most common type of food poisoning. I mean, we already talked about it, but I want to know how to spell it. Spell what? Staphylococcus aureus. S period aureus. Mm -hmm. All right, cool. Yeah, it is. But there's another type of food poisoning caused by another bacterium. This bacterium is called Bacillus. C E R E U S, serious. Bacillus serious. This bacterium causes the type of food poisoning that you get. You're not going to believe me. You're going to shake your head now. And you're going to say, what? Bacillus serious causes the type of food poisoning you get. I know you're not going to believe this. You're going to doubt me, as you often do. Bacillus cereus causes the type of food poisoning that you get from eating reheated rice and reheated pasta. Oh, I believe that, though. Oh, reheated pasta. That's the worst. Reheated rice oh, and reheated yeah. pasta. Oh, God. It's so good. Why? Even if it's refrigerated? Yep. So let me explain this to you. First of all, let me explain the signs and symptoms. It looks exactly the same as staph food poisoning. Mm. About an hour or two hours after eating it, you start to feel sick. You throw up every hour on the hour, except this one goes for eight to ten hours of throwing up. Mm. And there's always diarrhea with this one. Yeah. And you feel beat up for two days. Yeah. But then you're fine. So the question is, well, how does this happen? Because I eat this stuff all the time. I eat here, right? So I'm fine. <laughs> I get my olive garden. I take it out of the refrigerator and microwave. I'm fine. What I'm talking about is when you go to those restaurants or those places in the mall that have a steam table or like a buffet yes. where the rice and the noodles sit out all day. Mm -hmm. And the problem is, if there's still a bunch left, what are you going to do with them at the end of the day? They're going to put it in plastic, put plastic first wrap first over out. it, and they're going to stick the whole pan in the refrigerator. Mm -hmm. And that's perfectly acceptable. You can do that. However, the next day, it has to be brought up to the original heating temperature before it's put out on the steam table. They steam it, they steam it prior to the bunk. But unfortunately, what they do is they'll take it right out of the walk-in and put it right on the steam table. So rather than getting that heated like it's supposed to be back up to the original temperature before it goes on the steam table, it gets gradually heated. Oh, no, you're not supposed to do that. So, that's exactly what I'm saying, yes. Because if you do that, this happens. That's what I'm trying, that's the point I'm making. So what people do is they try to cut corners, and they go, well, I'll just come in an hour early and put it on the steam table, then I don't have to cook it. And then it gradually warms up, which means all that bacteria that's there, instead of getting killed, it's like a jacuzzi. So they grow and grow and grow. This is why you didn't get sick from your Olive Garden because you brought it home, put it in the fridge, and when you wanted it, you put it in the microwave and heated it up. Or even you ate it cold. You see, the problem is the gradual heating up actually creates more of an environment that the bacteria will grow and grow. 
as compared to if you just ate a cool right out of the refrigerator or if you heat it up in the microwave. So when you eat at those restaurants, you can tell them, please put that in the microwave for 30 seconds, a minute. Or if they have a wok, tell them to throw it all in the wok for a minute. That wok is so hot, it'll destroy anything that touches it real fast. Any bacteria that's there, it'll really Are you talking about a regular away. restaurant, not like a buffet style? Either one. Okay, so they'll still have any of their buffet style? Sometimes, yeah. 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 Where? Where? Aspirin. An acute non infectious. Interesting. Yeah, it's going to be aspirin. Uh, people think it's because aspirin is one of the few things that does get absorbed in the stomach, because it does. They think well, that does that causes problems with the stomach lining being absorbed that way. Well, not necessarily. Aspirin also decreases the prostaglandin synthesis that occurs, which helps the body to make that extra thick protective lining the stomach makes. So, if it blocks that production, the person is going to make less protection in their stomach, which means now their stomach acid, stomach protection balance is out of whack. So they're making not more acid, but they're making less protection. That can cause an irritation. Um, a chronic infectious gastritis is caused by Helicobacter pylori. Now, this is an interesting one because this is the most common cause of stomach ulcers. For the longest time, every doctor, every scientist knew that stomach ulcers were caused by stress and eating spicy foods. Everyone knew this. Everyone. <laughs> Until the late 1970s, when these two guys were working on this experimental bacteria, with experimental bacteria, and they found that the bacteria could live in the stomach. So they presented this information at a conference, conference and said, look everyone, we found this bacteria that could survive in the stomach and create ulcers. And everyone said, you're crazy. Nothing can survive in the stomach acid. You don't know what you're talking about. So this guy... Offended. He <laughs> infected himself? What do you mean? Said, oh, 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 but, oh. but... <laughs> so he goes back to the lab, mixes up a shot glass, basically, of his bacterium, drinks it down, <laughs> two weeks later, starts having all kinds of problems, vomiting, vomiting. Risky guy. Then. Uh, they biopsy his stomach, sure enough, they find the bacteria there. Well, he sure. proved to the world that he was right. By doing it to himself. <laughs> By doing it to himself, yes. So, now we know that stomach ulcers are not caused by stress or spicy foods. They're caused by Helicobacter pylori, which is a bacteria. So how are we going to treat that? Antibiotics. Antibiotics, exactly. That creates a chronic gastritis. Chronic infectious. Chronic non-infectious. These all have the same symptoms of each other? Similar. I mean, these are going to cause vomit, these here. These can cause pain, this can cause pain, this can cause pain. Hmm. But they can still, you can still have vomiting. Because if there's blood, like if there's an ulceration in the stomach, and blood is leaking into the stomach where the stomach acid would be, it's going to mix with that acid. When the person throws up, <laughs> but it doesn't look like blood. It looks like coffee grounds. Oh, it looks like somebody took a bunch of wet coffee grounds and just dumped them on the ground. Yeah. That's why we call it coffee ground emesis. Yeah. But that's actually partially digested blood. GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disease. Hmm. Failure of that lower esophageal sphincter causes chronic irritation. This is bad because it can lead to a type of cancer we call Barrett's esophagus. What do I have that there? I thought I had that there. Barrett's esophagus. Yeah, Barrett's. B-A-R-E-T-T-S. Barrett's esophagus. 
It's not in there. But can we, I have dyskinesia for type of cancer, but I thought I included it in there. What's in there now? Where did it in there now? Okay, good. Uh, emesis is vomiting. Remember, as an adult, for the most part, if you're throwing up, nobody cares. Most of the time, you, as an adult, most of you are what, about 17, 18 years old? <laughs> no. Nobody cares if you're throwing up because most of the time it doesn't mean anything. It's clinically insignificant. I know that people love to put that in their signs and symptoms when they say, Dr. Sturridge, I'm sorry I couldn't be here for the exam. I was sick. I had a headache and a sore throat, and I was throwing up. They always add it in the end, like, for dramatic effect. It is dramatic. It doesn't it feels the, only, dramatic. the only person who cares is your mother. Nobody else really cares. My mom doesn't care. She gets mad. Obviously, <laughs> if you're throwing up blood, obviously, if you're throwing up coffee grounds, obviously, if you're pregnant and you're throwing up more than you should be, then we're concerned. Um, but for the most part, in most adults, clinically insignificant. Oh, wow. Interesting. You feel like you're dying. Hernia. <laughs> Let me tell you what a hernia is so you know before leaving here, because this is important. Because people don't understand what a hernia actually is. When it's really simple, because you do understand the idea. By now, you're starting to realize that everything in the body is sort of sectioned off, right? Yes. That we have different places where different parts belong and other parts do not belong. A hernia is when there's an opening or a looseness in one of those sections, and it allows... part of an organ to move through. Oh, that's so weird. So if you have two hernias in one spot, there's two organs? No. Pushing no. It could just, just be double through. Hole. Yeah. Like one organ through. could be double through? Yeah. Mm. It's an easy fix. Hernias are simple fixes. Because whatever this wall is, whatever this is right here, should be tightened. So we can put a net right there and mesh. tighten it. A mesh, exactly. Yeah, that's right. And tighten it. All you got to do is move that in and tighten it. And put that in there, and then we don't have to worry about it coming through again. It's pretty simple. The problem is this. Sometimes these will go through and move on their own. They'll go through, and then they'll move back. So you'll hear people call that a rolling hernia. A reducible hernia means that it goes back on its own, or you can move it back on its own. You can push it back on yes, its own. Sir. Then we call it reducible. Oh, my God. If it doesn't reduce on its own, then we say it's incarcerated. It's stuck. It's not moving. It's there for, for the next seven to ten years. <laughs> no. no. My dad's been hernia for a while. Oh, I'm incarcerated. Yeah, it's not. No, incarcerated just means it's stuck. Nobody's getting out. Nobody's moving. <laughs> However, if it's incarcerated, that could also mean it's really tight. In this case, it could be so tight it's strangulated. If this is strangulated, this is a piece of tissue. Look at this. This is an organ. This is part of an organ. Organs made of tissues. Tissues made of cells. If this is strangulated, what's happening to the blood supply that's going down there? It's getting cut off. What's going to happen to those cells? They're going to die. It's going to happen to the tissue. It's going to die. If this is part of intestine, what do we have living in our intestines? Waste. Living in our intestines. Oh, living bacteria. Bacteria. So if there's dead tissue there, what loves dead tissue? Oh, bacteria. Bacteria. And what do we have a lot of right there? Oh, bacteria. Bacteria. Which means if that dies, it will definitely get infected quickly. It's spread. And that will go into the blood, septicemia, death. Okay. So, hernias can be dangerous. If they are strangulated. If they are incarcerated, there will be a lot of pain. If they're rolling, if they're a reducible hernia, we still need to fix it. That's what a hernia is, though. I want you everybody to understand that before you leave here. Hyperemesis gravidarum, excessive vomiting during pregnancy. When do we expect her to be thrown up during her pregnancy? What trimester? First. First. And what time during the day? Morning. Morning, morning, morning right? That's why I call it morning sickness. However, she can actually be thrown up in the afternoon, right? Of course. Or in the evening, right? Yeah. If it's all the time, that's a problem. Especially if it goes in the second trimester. 
or the third. Then it's hyperemesis gravidarum. Why is that bad? <coughs> you be drawn up good stuff too. If she's not getting any nutrients, baby's not getting any nutrients. You see how that can become a problem? Yeah. This is why in the first trimester of pregnancy, most women will say, I lost weight at the beginning of my pregnancy. Of course you did. You had no appetite, you felt like you were going to be sick, or you didn't get sick a lot. So yeah, you lost some weight at the beginning, but then it came back, didn't it? Oh. <laughs> 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 All right, intussusception. Intussusception, which is this one here. Not this one. This one. No. No. What the? Intussusception. Part of the. Oh. Oh, I just I just watched a video about this. Now I'm gonna go find it. There you go. It was like an overlap. It's actually a telescope within. And this is dangerous because now this is really tight right here. I don't know. Which means blood supply cut off. It can leave areas here where particles can get caught. Um, particles like picoliths, which is basically poop that is like a solid mass of poop around the sea or something. Like it's, it's like a pebble of poop. But it can get lodged in here and that can create an inflammatory process. It just happens. This here? Yes. It just happens. Um, because this also happens. Bobolus. Oh, it was like a knot in your intestines? Yeah. Ooh. It loops around, which means all the blood supply is cut off, just like kink in a garden hose. What's going to happen to this tissue? It's going to swell up. It's going to die. It's going to die. How long do we see irreversible cell death in this tissue? Six hours. The blood supply? Six hours. So how long till we get this baby into surgery? Six hours. Less than six hours. Exactly. Less than six hours. That's why this is an emergency. This baby's going to come in. You see the little baby body right here. Oh. This baby's going to come in with a really swollen abdomen, screaming in pain. Oh. And it's going to be just happened. solid. Yeah. So we're going to have to take this baby right into surgery and fix this. Mm. Now why is it happening to babies and not adults? <coughs> yeah, they're still growing. Right? Yeah. All our stuff is sort of in its place now. Everything's kind of anchored where it's supposed to be. Yeah. They're still growing. Did you ever face them? Oh, God, no. <laughs> <laughs> I never this. That's crazy. Thank so, God I never saw this because this is one of those things that if you mistake it, if you mistake this for gas, you know, if you think there's oh, it's a little bloating, it's no big deal, and you send the kid home, you have a dead baby in a couple of hours. So this is one that you better hope the doctor who catches it knows what he's doing. Um, uh, mouth, cleft lip, yeah, and uh, baby was unconscious. Oh, but did you cry? Did I cry? Did you cry? Did you cry? Or did you cry? Um, uh, circumcision. You say you don't cry? No. Cry during the circumcision. <laughs> <laughs> 45 minutes. 